Well, good morning. And yes, this is our last online morning service. Feels very significant, doesn't it? Well, I'm here to continue with the Just Believe series that we've been looking at. And I was really pleased when Tim gave me the topic that he gave me. It's based around John 14, verse 1, where it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Now, for me, as I say, I was really pleased when Tim gave me this topic because it's been a verse that's been really important to me and learning to trust and believe in order for my heart not to be troubled has been something that's been a lifelong journey. Everybody comes with different life circumstances. We've all had different experiences and sometimes we react to different things in different ways. For me, I was born into a war and I picked up a lot of my parents' fear and the things that were going on around me. I just, as a child, I absorbed a lot of that and then had to work through that, that troubled heart that I'd almost gained through circumstances. I had to work through that in a lot of circumstances. And this verse was a real key because as a child, I'd always believed in God. That was never a question. I believed God, that there was a God. I believed he existed, but the belief also in me was really key. It was when I came to believe also in Jesus that my life changed and that I experienced a complete, completely different understanding, a completely different outlook, a complete change. And that belief in Jesus has been what then became really key in helping to work through the troubles of my heart. And the more and more I would step closer and closer to Jesus, the more he helped me to work through the troubles of my heart. So this verse is really, really special to me. It's been a key anchor at certain times in my life. And at the moment, I'm actually, some of you will already know, training to swim the channel, which is not, I'm not doing a solo swim, I'm doing it as part of a team. And we've been having to learn how to swim in the sea. And this is to swim with a purpose. It's not a case of just swimming in the sea for fun. It is that swimming with a purpose in order to get somewhere. And I found it really, really disconcerting swimming in the sea with the intention of trying to get somewhere because the water just pulls you around. You're pulled around all the time. Whereas swimming in a lake, if you're set on a, a, a purpose, you're going in a direction and you swim and you get there and it, you're just not pulled around to the same extent as you are at the sea. And it's very, very disconcerting. Concerting. There's a great verse in James that I felt really reflected that in relation to this almost like the troubled, the disconcerting feeling, the, 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 the being pulled around this way and that. In James 1 verse 6 it says, he must believe and not doubt because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And it's this belief in God, but not just God, it's also this belief in Jesus that provides us with a sense of security and something that we anchor ourselves in when everything around us is pulling us this way and that. It gives us something sure and secure, our belief. Tim mentioned the word the belief can mean to entrust ourselves and we can give our troubled hearts over to Jesus, when we believe in him, we entrust our troubled hearts over to him. This last week has been Mental Health Awareness Week. I'm not sure if that's something you will have been aware of, but I thought that this particular topic fits in beautifully with, because, well, mental health is one of those things, isn't it, where I don't like the stigma that the, the words mental health actually bring, because I think mental health should be about healthy mentality in a sense just in the same way we would talk about physical health and physical health requires routine things to be in our lives the, the way we eat the way we exercise those things help to maintain good physical health there are certain things that we can do to help maintain good mental health and I thought that was a great um, sort of link in today with today's message and wanted to explore some actual uh, practical things, routine things that we can do daily that reflect both this verse and will help us with helping to maintain good mental health. So those three things that I have 
They're very practical, very simple things that I have picked out as being good habits that we can develop in, in our lives. The first one is daily. Put your heart in God's hands. Put your heart in his hands daily. What do I mean by that? Psalm 32 verse 8 says, the Lord says, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. How reassuring is that? It's fantastic. He promises to guide us on the best pathway for our lives. He promises to advise us and to watch over us. That is beautiful, so reassuring. But it is for us to choose to walk in the way that he shows us. That it's for us to choose to follow his guidance, for us to choose to follow his advice. And it's a conscious decision that we have to make. And that sense of actually placing our lives into his hands and saying, will you direct? Will you guide me? Will you advise me? knowing full well that he will watch over us. Jesus talked about laying our lives down when we choose to follow him. And it doesn't mean that we're losing our free will at all. It just means we're choosing to put him first in every aspect of our lives, to seek his desire, his will over our own in every part of our lives, to live our lives so it's not about us. Jesus was once asked by an academic Pharisee, who was trying to catch Jesus out, what is the greatest commandment? Now, if we want to place our heart in God's hands and put him first, we need to know what it is that he wants of us. So what is the greatest commandment? What does he, what does he tell us? What does he say to us? And it's interesting that Jesus' response to this Pharisee was that he didn't just give one commandment, but he gave two commandments. They are so intrinsically linked, these commandments, that we can't do one without the other. And it was this, Matthew 22, verse 37 to 39. Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. We basically cannot love God without loving people. They are so closely linked. But it's this love the Lord your God with all that comes across so strongly, with all, with every part of you. Therefore, we need to place our all in God's hands, entrust our all, entrust our heart, our soul, our mind to him and allow him to lead and guide us. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. The importance of this, the heart of who we are, we need to put it into God's hands for his safekeeping, his protection, that he will guard it. And by placing it in his hands, he will guard it, because everything that is in our heart comes out in our life. Matthew 6 verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What do you value most? It's saying, whatever you value most, your heart will be there. So if you value God most, place your heart in his hands and allow him to lead and guide you every day, through the day, a routine thing that we can do. The second routine thing that we can do is to feed our mind, intentionally feed our minds. Don't just allow things just to, you know, like junk food, fill your mind. Intentionally feed your mind. What do you fill your mind with? What are you feeding it? Is it things that'll draw you closer to God or is it things that'll push you away from God? Are you feeding your mind with things that'll strengthen your belief or are you feeding your mind with things that will cause your heart to be troubled? Romans 12 verse 2 says, Don't copy the behaviour and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
God has the capacity to change us and to transform us. And it's an amazing thing. Romans 4 verse 17, the second half of it says, Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. If God can create out of nothing, he can make you new. He can make you a new person by transforming and changing the way that you think. But we do have to choose to intentionally engage with that. We, God gives us free will. He allows us to choose and to choose to engage with that. So we need to choose to fill our mind with good thoughts. God says that in Isaiah 55 verse 8, he says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Our thoughts are not like his thoughts, but we can learn to think, or to a certain extent, it says beyond what we could imagine. His thoughts are far beyond what we could imagine, so they'll be far greater than we can ever actually absorb. But we can start to learn to think a little bit like he does. We can learn by getting to know him more. And the way that we do that and the way that we find out what his thoughts are is by reading the Bible. That's what we have. That's what he has given us as a way of getting to know him. So we can choose to fill our mind and to feed our mind with the things that are with his thoughts as much and as close as possible on this earth through reading the Bible. And we need to do that daily. Fill our mind, feed our mind with his thoughts daily. For some people, I know it can be a real challenge as to actually, well, reading, what, what, what shall I read? I don't know what to read. I could just open my Bible and read it. But actually following a systematic um, program can be really helpful for a period of time of just that regular, learning to get into good habits of regularly reading. And Rob has, um, he's introduced us to the idea of Project 345, which is a lovely Bible reading program that takes you through the New Testament in a year. And it's systematic and really helpful. And quite a few people are going to be doing that. So if you do struggle with that, maybe join in and do that and, and follow the, the program to help feed your mind with good thoughts, with God's thoughts. And Philippians 4 verse 8 also says, fix your thoughts. There's an intention in that, choosing to fix our thoughts on something specific. It says, fix your thoughts on what is true and honourable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. It is a choice to choose what we focus our thoughts on not negative things that are going to cause your heart to be troubled, but fixing your thoughts on positive things, on things that are right, pure. You know, there are moments, aren't there, where life can throw things at you that really do undermine you and make you feel very, you know, uncertain and disconcerted and all the rest of it. And in those moments, finding the good things to think about in the circumstances, it makes such a difference when you can focus on those positive things. And so silencing the negative, the negative thoughts that might be going around your head by purposefully choosing to fix. That's a, that's a, it's like a permanent thing, isn't it? Fix, fix your thoughts on the good things, on the positive things. But again, it's a daily discipline. Let's choose to feed our minds with good things, with God's things. And the third practical thing that we can do daily is to create sacred space. Now, what do I mean by this? I think this past year, sacred space has been one of those things that I've thought about a lot, just because life's been very, very different. And I have this real sense of that sacred space is very important. You might recall Tim talking about keeping the Sabbath holy. He was talking about the principle that we get in the Old Testament of having time where we take time aside to rest. But he was saying more than just rest, we take time in that rest time to worship God and to do something that brings us, draws us closer to God. So we are replenished in the rest and in the worship. And I just wanted to explore that a little bit more as this idea of sacred space. It's that time of set, taking yourself aside, apart, 
and yet also worshipping God in that space and in that moment. And I'm talking about sacred space in your mind and in your heart, not necessarily physical space, but within your, within your mind and within your heart as a daily practice. In the, um, in the Old Testament, Solomon, the, the temple of Solomon, rather, the, 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 Solomon, the temple that Solomon built, um, in the centre of it was an area called the Holy of Holies, which the priests at certain times and after certain things that they had done were allowed to enter into, and in doing so entered into the presence of God. This holy, holy place, it was a sacred space that they chose to go into and to enter into. And we can enter into that sense of God's presence when we choose to set aside a little bit of time in our day and to focus on him. It is an intentional choice because he's with us all the time. We know his presence is with us all the time, but we can remind ourselves of that by just stopping, resting in a sense and choosing to focus on him. And how do we choose to focus on him? Well, we acknowledge him for who he is. We glorify him. We, 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 we say who he is. You are God. You are our father. And we, we worship him. We acknowledge who he is. We glorify him and we magnify him. We say who he is. And that worship is what then brings us into the knowledge and the fresh sense of his presence right there in that moment. Now, Tim's recently been teaching quite a bit on um, Ezra 3, the chapter in Ezra where it talks about the rebuilding of the temple that the Israelites did. Um, and it's a story that's felt like it's really spoken into the moment of where we are at, where it feels a little bit like we're rebuilding our lives. Um, and this passage it's, uh, that I want to just refer to, we get a huge mix of emotions going on amongst the Israelites. It's a very significant moment in their history where they're re-establishing their place of worship to God. And there's a real mix of emotions. Ezra 3 verse 11 to 13, it says, With praise and thanksgiving they sang to God. He is good. His love to Israel endures forever. And the, peoples gave, the people gave a great shout of praise to the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. And I love this picture that it gives us that actually in worship there can be a huge mix of emotions, um, that there's this sense of weeping alongside shouts of joy. And I feel like we're at, in re-establishing our lives now, there is going to be a real mix of emotions. But God doesn't mind that. He really doesn't mind that. In our worship, when we come with mixed emotions, he really doesn't mind. Matthew 12, verse 20. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smouldering wick he will not snuff out till he has brought justice through to victory. So however you might feel in creating a sacred space in your heart and in your mind, in your life, if you feel a whole mix of emotions, just still worship God anyway, because he doesn't mind. Similarly, Psalm 51 verse 17 says, the sacrifice you desire, this is of God, he desires from us, is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. God never rejects the broken and repentant heart. So if you feel unworthy to come into God's presence, you know that he accepts you just as you are and you can worship him. Psalm 89 verse 15 this is really intriguing. Blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you. That is, in a sense, to praise God. Sorry, blessed are those who have learned to acclaim you, who walk in the light of your presence, O Lord. This word acclaim, like I said, is, it is about praise. And we get into in the, the, these other versions. It says, a joyful call to worship and a festal shout. A festal shout is um, an archaic word that relates to 
festival and celebration. And I really like that because we are festival. We are a festival church and we love to be able to celebrate God and to shout and, and call and praise and worship him. It is a part of who we are. But this, this particular verse here, a claim, if we look in the original, in the, in the Hebrew, the word here is teruah. And teruah has a homonym. Now, I love, well, I enjoy language. And I love that in so many languages, we find homonyms that just, I think, really speak of the fact that God uh, designed these languages. So in English, we have the son of God who rose from the dead. And then we have the sun that rises every day. Those two words sound the same. They are a homonym, but they are obviously are referring to completely different things. And this homonym that we have here in Hebrew of teruah, the homonym that goes with the word triumphant is the word brokenness. And I just think how, what a fascinating um, sort of juxtaposition there of a brokenness with triumphant because actually when we come to worship it that's that it somehow sums up that it's okay to bring all of our brokenness and to shout and to praise God regardless and I just love the fact that that sort of seemed to capture it that that verse from um from Psalm 89 Jesus invites us Revelation 3 20 he says look I stand at the door and knock if you hear my voice and open the door I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. It's one of my favorite images in the Bible is that sense of Jesus coming and sitting and eating with us. And that's a daily thing. It's a routine thing, isn't it, is to eat. So why not have these routine things, these routine habits that we do daily that in a sense are like sitting down and eating with Jesus. And those routine things, the three things that I mentioned, putting your heart in his hands, allowing him to lead and guide you, filling your mind, feeding your mind with his word and his thoughts and creating sacred space, a place where you can bring all that you are, your brokenness and your praise to him, but setting aside that time daily to do that. And those are what I'd love to challenge you with today because I believe they will be things that will really help you to believe more in God to believe more in Jesus and therefore not to let your heart be troubled.